I believe. Yeah. And he was, uh, you know, incredibly important in driving the parameterization of the newest generation of the Amber biopolymer force fields, the uh, FF19SB. And we're super excited to have him out here visiting. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and just ask during the, the talk. We end up being very interactive here, uh, both locally and uh, virtually. So um, without further ado, I'll just hand it over to Chuang. Thank you, Chuang. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so first, thanks to OpenFF for inviting me. Uh, thanks, John, for hosting. Thanks, Carmen and uh, Hannah for organizing. Thanks to the group. Uh, so my name is Chuan. I'm from uh, Carl Simulis Lab at Stony Brook University. Uh, so this is my uh, first time to be here. I'm very happy to present our uh, new protein force VF of 19 SB. Uh, so it's it's been um, almost five years since we last published FF14 SB. Uh, that few years was almost my entire PhD. Also, um, so we are glad. We are very excited to present FF19 SB now. And the main uh, contribution of uh, 19SB development to the whole field of force field development is we uh, try to uh, systematically train the amino acid specific proton backflow by hydro parameters. And we use quantum mechanics energies in solution instead of gas phase. Uh, so I'll talk about this uh, force field in the next uh, 30 minutes. So this is our to my talk. Uh, I'll give you a little background on MD and Ember force field, I'm sure. Uh, most of you are very familiar with this, but I want to talk more about the force field limitations, which are the, also the motivation behind FN19SB development. And then I'll go through the strategies of uh, how we uh, parameterize the, for, uh, the force field, and then show how great 19 sb is in terms of the agreement with the experimental data, uh, different types of experiment, and then make the conclusion. So I guess, um, uh, most of you will agree on this, uh, that computation experiments are complementary uh, in biochemical studies. There are a lot of things that cannot be mirrored uh, precisely in the experiment, uh, and then uh, the computational models will be uh, very powerful. Uh, they will give us a lot of information on, on the biology, such as protein folding or uh, DNA protein interactions in the nucleosome, or how um, in the drug discovery, how a ligand passed through the, the pathway. Uh, and bind to the target. And those uh, videos were uh, generated from MD simulation, which use uh, classical mechanical force field to do all the calculation. But all, of course, you can use other level of theory to do the calculation, like quantum mechanics or a mixture of QMMM, and which method you use really depends on what questions you want to solve and what level of accuracy you want to achieve. So in Simulis lab, we use a classical mechanical uh, force field to do most of the biological studies. So uh, in terms of the force field, uh, since uh, it is still a classical approximation to the reality, so there are a lot of uh, uh, physics that is missing in the model. So that's why the, the force field keep changing over years, and it is improving, actually. So uh, this is a recent development of Ember force field in the past uh, 20 years. <laughs> since uh, FF99SB uh, was uh, developed in 2006 and FF03 in 2003, there are a few variants after that, like FF99SB ILDN from D. Shaw and uh, uh, LDN Q from Robert Bass. And then after that, we have 14SB uh, and then have uh, 50 IPQ, a uh, force balance from Li Ping Wang, and uh, uh, 9SB disk from D. Shaw. And then now we have 19SB. Uh, so this is the protein force with development. And in the meantime, uh, so these, these, these water models are keep improving uh, as well. And those are not from, not all from Ember, but uh, some, some, some of them are from Ember developer. So we have T3P in, uh, back in 1980s. And after that, uh, we have a few uh, four plus model like 4PW and 4P2005. And then we have force balance three and four, which are also the water model developed in the Leaping Walls group. And then OPC from Alice in on the Frif, and T4PD from uh, DE Shaw. So uh, this, uh, there is a sort of uh, interaction between the protein force field and the water force field, because uh, uh, some of the force field have to be parameterized together with the solvent model in order to better reproduce experimental <laughs> data. Uh, ideally, that's not a, a perfect uh, strategy, but considering the overall limitation of the class model, it's, uh, sometimes it's practically benefit, uh, beneficial. Uh, so, uh, but as I said, uh, the, both the protein force field and the water force field are improving over, over years, and we have seen a lot of uh, <coughs> great uh, MD studies using this uh, force field. 
so there are a lot of other great studies, of course. Uh, and here I'm just showing some examples of using 14 SP uh, to do some uh, MD. So uh, for instance, in the, uh, the top uh, plot, in our lab, we are trying to fold a uh, protein with system size up to 100, uh, 100 residue uh, from fully extended structure using 14 SP GB NAC2. Or in the bottom left plot, where we can reproduce some local chemical properties like order parameter using 14 SP tips with P. Uh, you probably cannot see this, but the, on, the, on the bottom plot, it shows the overlap between 14SB and AMR data. So it's, pre it's pretty good. And also in the uh, uh, drug discovery uh, application, we uh, attended this RGC4 to do the binding free energy uh, prediction, and we use 14SB up to tips repeat, and we, we have a, achieved a very uh, good performance, uh, which is kind of, kind of the top one uh, performance in the, in the session we attended. Uh, for the 39 molecules. Uh, uh, but uh, and we can also uh, do other things like a CD melting curve or AMRG coupling and others. But uh, with all these uh, great achievements and uh, success with the force field, I always remind uh, myself that, that this is still a classical model, which all models are wrong and uh, some are useful. Another thing is all, mo all models are wrong, just a matter of time. So. Um, we, we still need to think about the limitation of the, of the force field and then trying to improve it, um, which the force field will still be compromised. The accuracy of the force field will still be compromised on the computer power. So um, one thing that uh, the current force field uh, doesn't work really well is, um, for instance, the correlation on the helical principle is, is imperfect. The, the helical principle is, uh, is a measurement from the MR uh, that show how likely the amino acid want to form a helix. So different amino acids, you can see different amino acids will have different helical frequency. Like alanine will be will be most likely to form a helix, and proline glycine will be the least. So if you look at this piece of data that we uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, the helical frequency from the MD prediction, which is on the y-axis, and the helical frequency from the MR experiment, from, which is on axis for 20 different amino acids. Each, uh, each, uh, each uh, point represents an amino acid with a value from both empty simulation and experiment, a helical current state. So we run really long simulation for, this, for each of these uh, 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 peptide. And we can see the correlation is pretty bad. So with R square only point, uh, 0.38. So and 14 sbt 3 p seems to be a very reasonable combination uh, for the force field. We can, we can reproduce a lot of uh, experimental data really well with this combination, but in terms of this test, it doesn't work really well, uh, which show a fundamental issue with 14 sb t 3 p in mutation studies. So for instance, if you have like a mutation in a drug uh, binding pocket and that causes drug resistance uh, effect, then uh, if you want to study it, then the MR set from aspartate to alanine, for instance, the, the, the helical frequency uh, increases, but according to the simulation, it decreases. So, and that's just one uh, example. If you look at the correlation, that means we might make more mistakes in other in other uh, systems. So we, we we see this problem and we are trying to fix it, uh, but uh, instead of empirically uh, fixing the symptoms like the helical frequency correlation, we ask a more uh, general question: What fundamentally is limiting? The sequence dependency. So what is causing it? So we see the helical frequency is wrong, but that might, that might not be the cause. It might just be the symptom of the force field. So uh, what we, we, we also generated, uh, collected a lot of uh, data trying to find out the reason. And one thing that we found is uh, the error or inaccuracy is in the amino acid specific backbone preference. So here I'm showing the the phi and psi distribution for alanine and valine, those data are from the PDB coil library. And if you look at, if you compare these two uh, distribution, they are clearly different. The alanine prefers uh, PB2 much more uh, than uh, extended, than beta, and valine prefers a more flat distribution, and uh, the beta and the PB2 are evenly, uh, have the even, evenly high peak. And uh, the alpha region in valine is more rigid, and uh, the alpha, helical basin in the alanine is more uh, diagonal. So we see the difference uh, in the PDB between alanine and valine. We're trying to see 
what is what is the distribution looks like in 14 SB, for instance. But we cannot simulate all the PDB structures. We just use a dipeptide, which the comparison might be limited. But since we only include the coil library structures, which the structure should, shouldn't have any crystal packing, or it should be more exposed to the solution. So we use dipeptide to mimic that environment. Uh, and we can see 14 SB, uh, if we, we run a dipeptide using 14 SB in the, in the explicit element, and we can see the distribution look almost the same. So both prefer PB2 much more than beta, and both have very uh, spherical um, basin and very symmetric. Um, but as I said, this comparison is limited, and we, we can't exactly match the dipeptide simulation and PDB. And it doesn't, also, it doesn't make any sense to match dipeptide to the PDB. But let's look at another uh, piece of data. So we calculate quantum mechanics energies on the grid for that peptide. So we scan a that peptide and we have a grid of structures and we calculate the QM energies and we plot this and we can see they don't agree with each other and they agree much better with the PDB than the 14 SB. So especially for alanine, if you look at the, uh, the alpha basin, it's more diagonal and in the valine, it's more rigid and it has this V shape in the beta PB2 region, like here, right? This is very similar to what we see in the PDB. But uh, but this is still a qualitative comparison. But and we, we, we do this for all the 20, 20 amino acids when we see the similar trend. And that makes us to think uh, that maybe we should treat different amino acids differently using different quantum data. That might be a good strategy. Um, and before uh, moving forward, I want to show some work from other group. So uh, like in Robert Bass group, who also do the force field development, they see the problem in the helical propensity. Uh, they see the correlation is pretty bad. And uh, they look at the data and see, well, this is not using the same force field. This uh, on the left is using 14 SP, and on the right is using 99 SP. But uh, you get the point that the correlation is both uh, really bad in, in both cases. Uh, so they look at the data and trying to refit some of the outliers like DE and IL and then to trying to improve the correlation. And it seems the correlation gets a little better. The R square is 0.5 and slope is 0.6, but it's not very good. And also in their fitting, since they only refit the outliers, so just leave the other amino acid unchanged, then generally this fitting is not very consistent across amino acid. You treat them differently, just trying to improve this correlation. So uh, they have limitations, but this paper, this policy was developed 10 years ago. And uh, uh, so both of the four, both of the four were uh, uh, combined with T3P water model, but I haven't talked, really talked about some model yet. But what if the correlation that we see with 14SB is really because of the solid model? What if the T3P is not a good one, right? And apparently T3P is not a good, is not a good one. So this is a data from LSE Onufri that showed the, the errors of the, on the bulky properties for different water model. Like on the, on the left, the T3P has really large error for most of the uh, bulky property, like the cell diffusion constant and also the, the the isothermal uh, compressibility and others. And uh, SPCE T5B is also uh, not very good. And T4PW seems a little better, but not, not, that, not that good. The OPC seems to be very uh, promising. So uh, we see the performance of the different water models. We ask, what if we substitute T3P with a better water model? Will 14SP give a, give a better correlation? So, uh, so here um, I want to ask uh, you a question. How many of you think this will definitely improve the correlation? And you, okay. Almost and, nobody's <laughs> raised their hands. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many of you think this will definitely not improve, and improve the correlation? Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, the rest will be the maybe, right? Uh, yeah, so, so if, if the OPC <laughs> can improve the, if the OPC can improve the correlation, then there won't be 19 SP, right? So, so the answer is definitely, <laughs> definitely no. Uh, with, with, uh, with OPC, it, we won't improve the correlation on the helical frequency. Uh, you can see all the plots of the helical frequency are all reduced by almost similar amount 
uh, but the correlation is still bad. R squared is 0.27. And I think that's not surprising to me because the water model actually is not a like, main function of any degraphism of the solid or peptide rotation, right? Just uh, some non bounding interactions. So if you think the OPC can improve it, then probably that's too much responsibility to the, on the solvent model itself. So the, the, the problem might still be in the, in the fourth view. Uh, and also we, we try to uh, re remove the outliers like D, G, and P, uh, and the correlation is not getting any better. So, so go back to, the, to this plot. So we, 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 we think we might need to train, uh, treat a different amino acid uh, with a different quantum mechanics energy. That might be a good uh, strategy, right? Um, and we are more uh, certain that after looking at uh, other people's work, we are more uh, certain that uh, neither simple force field refitting like what Robert Bass has done uh, or uh, water updating uh, solves the problem. We really need more uh, uh, systematic training of the force field. So um, that drive us to uh, revisit the assumptions that have been made in the force field training that might limit the accuracy. And there are a lot of assumptions in the, in the force field, like the, we use like one force scaling, that's two empirical, and the Vanderbilt's or fixed charge model. But one of the, but a few uh, things that we think are really, really important are uh, the first, we, we use uncoupled 1D uh, cosine function uh, for the phi and side dihedral. Uh, and they are overly symmetric. So uh, here I'm showing uh, two uh, plots. The plot on the left is the current correction in the fi 14 sp which I, uh, this is the Ramachandra plot, on the Ramachandra plot. So I scan the fine side and calculate the energy by applying the cosine functions of fine side. So they are very symmetric because those are uncoupled 1D. They, they don't depend on each other, right? Um, and here on the right, is the perfect correction, which was generated by calculating quantum and calculating the 14 SP without any bicep dihedrals. And that should be our target. That, that should be the, the, those should be what we correct for. So they clearly don't look, each other, look, look, uh, look like each other. And uh, in the perfect correction map, we see the diagonal features, which probably, because, which probably uh, show that this is a 2D problem instead of 1D problem. And another assumption uh, we have made is we use backbone, uh, so the backbone dihedral dependence on the amino acid is insufficient because we use the same atom type uh, for all the backbone dihedrals, right? So we train against alanine and apply to all. But alanine might not be a very good model because if you look at halo density, this alanine is the highest, right? Probably should take some, something, that, some way, or something in the middle to, 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 to make this better. And the lastly is, uh, which is, I think it's a little complicated, is uh, there is an inconsistent treatment for partial charges and dihedral fitting. So we have adopted to use resin charges that were uh, developed in 1990s, and they were calculated in Hartree Fox 631 G star to uh, better mimic the in solution because the charges won't, won't change in the MD simulation. So, so we want some overestimating on the polarization to better mimic the in solution dipoles. And, uh, in the meantime, there are a lot of work on dihedral fitting that use gas phase energy. And what's even worse, uh, people might make the gas phase energy calculation much uh, more and more accurate by like, using MP2CC, PVTZ, or even like the complete basis set. So that, the reason why that, that will make it worse is because uh, you use the charges to do the dihedral fitting, and that will counteract the intended great polarization effect when, we, when you do the dihedral. And you use gas phase, so you are counteracting a lot of the solid polarization effects. So those are the three main things uh, that we think are uh, very important. So then comes to our uh, strategy, um, the force field uh, improvements. So uh, there are basically uh, three steps in the a force field uh, parameterization. The step one is a pick model system, and then you create some reference data, and then uh, you, you come up with the objective function to, to get the parameters. So the, the, for the model system, we use dipeptide. We use a bunch of different dipeptides, and we scan the fine side dihedral in, uh, in full space, uh, in two-dimensional uh, space. And we save each structure and calculate energies using quantum uh, in solution and MM uh, in solution. 
and we will get a lot of uh, uh, energy surface for, uh, for different amino acids with certain group, like leucine, we use leucine as a model and apply it to the tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine because we really don't want to have the ring effects uh, incorporated in the, into the backbone. But for all the residues, all the rest residues, we have their own like pre-analyte calculation. And for the objective function, we use CMAP. So this CMAP is not a, actually objective function. Uh, and they can do a perfect fitting actually. So the, the, when we calculate the CMAP, we just um, use QM and subtract MM without any dihedral. So the fitting error will be zero. So, the, so there, there is no fitting error in, in this process. So the error will be in the transferability. When you change the, tra you change the structure, that will cause the transferab transferability error. Uh, but in the training, we got a zero uh, fitting error, right? Uh, and eventually, we have a 16 uh, CMAPs applied to uh, 20 different amino acids with certain group. Uh, and that requires a lot of uh, QM calculations, actually. Can you explain again what CMAPs So, the, so, so this, this is a, the plot on the CMAP on the right. So we, we calculate QM energies on the grid. So we have 24 by 24 structures, and we calculate MM energies on the grid. And we do a simple subtraction to get the CMAP. It's a spline, to, a 2D right. spline. You apply it to two co uh, coordinated torsions that you add as a correction onto the individual single 4A terms right. for each torsion. Right. So it's a, a coupling term between two different torsions. Right. In, in the MD simulation, we will fit with the back of this spline function and take the derivative and drive the MD. Um, in the calculation, we just do like single point energy calculation. Um, so that, 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 that's why I said it's a zero fitting error. But mm -hmm. you, you really count on that the, the bicubic split, split fitting is, mm -hmm. there's is zero, zero um, error, right? If, if the bicubic split, split fitting has some error, that will be also the error of the CMAP. And we use 15 degree, which probably too big of the spacing, probably can use 10 or other. So that's the limitation of the CMAP also. Uh, so uh, I want to. Um, show something that I thought is really uh, worth mentioning in the 19SB development. The first is uh, we fit the same map to the salvated QM, and we do this for multiple uh, amino acids. So here on the left is the QM energies in gas phase, and on the right is our training, uh, the reference data in our training, which is QM in solution. You can see they are very, very different. Right? We, we try to avoid using QM in gas phase because if you look at this uh, energy surface, it, it doesn't look like a protein at all. It doesn't have a minimum in R, so it doesn't have in the beta and the, the transition region, the gamma term is really stable. Uh, and that's the training data that we use for 14 Um And another big, uh, uh, a big thing that I think is very important is we fit CMAP to partially relax the PDB rotimer. So it's very straightforward for alanine and the glycine CMAP generation. So we scan the five side, we do the calculation. But what if they have a rotimer? So which rotimer should we use? It's not 2D problem, it's like multi-dimensional problem, right? So uh, that's a very um, complex question and you, different people might have different uh, uh, strategies. But in our method, we uh, initialized all the rotimer to be 175, which is the most popular rotimer in the PDB coil library. And then I relax the side chain with a strong five side restraint to make sure the structure is still on the grid, but the rotimer can be relaxed with respect to that five side value, right? And then um, I plot this, I, I, I did this plot, which is also in on the Ramachandra plot, uh, the, the, which is a heat map on the chi one value of the veiling. So if you look at the color, it goes from 150 to 210. That's the, that's the dihedral value of the chi-1. So we initialize to be 175. After relaxation, they start to, uh, start to change the rotimer conformation, right? And uh, uh, so which probably, probably shows that we are not actually using the PDB rotimer, which is the most popular rotimer, the, the trans rotimer. But if you look at the PDB data, they report uh, Kaiwa as 175, but they also report a range because it cannot be that precise from the PDB. So the range is 145 to 205. So we are still in that range. So I think that should be fine. And, the, and the, in practice, the benefit of doing this is we are avoid incorporating the non-bounded errors into the same map. 
for instance, there is a hydrogen bond error that we incorporate into our uh, CMAP, then it will apply it anyway, no matter it's hydrogen bond form or not, right? So we don't want to do that. And another is if we use a global minimum for each of the five side, the, the rotimer, that means if you uh, walk across the, the CMAP, when you change the five side by 15 degree, then your rotimer changed by like 80 degree. That's a big change. Then what if the side chain that Hadron has error? We don't want to do that. So in this process, we want we, we eventually we make sure all the side chains are still similar, but they are different. So have that's you, have you thought about correcting the side chain rotimers or doing a more extensive refit of the side chains as well? Or was there a reason you decided not to do that? So so the reason why we we because uh, in the, the side chain rotimer uh, were uh, represented using 14 SP parameters. Mm -hmm. Those were uh, systematically, I think we, we already do a like, very a systematic job on that fitting. So we think we really can't do anything more with that, uh, for, uh, with that uh, rotimer, so uh, with side chain that he rolls. When you went through this process then, did you leave those fixed and then refit on this separate new data set or did you fit everything consistently to the, all the data you had generated previously? So yeah. Did you refit the fine? No, sign? I didn't refit. I'm oh, sorry, the, the chi. chi to no, the, I didn't refit chi. So they were just yeah. left fit. Yeah, they were just left fit. Yeah. But was that data included in your fit too, or just the new data then? Just just the new uh, quantum data. Just the new quantum just data. New quantum just data. Just okay. new quantum okay. data. And they are actually using different quantum data. 14 SP was trained against gas phase. Ah. Yeah. Interesting. But I have a plot that shows that if we look at the profile for like chi one or chi two. Mm -hmm. The, the, the data, uh, the QM gas phase, the QM gas phase data actually look very similar to the QM in solution data. For the same yeah, kind Probably yeah. because it's veiling, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not very polarized. Um, yes, and we use like the, the optimizer that is implemented in Ember, which mm -hmm. will also be used when you do the actual mm -hmm. MD simulation to do this relaxation. Um, so as I said, the CMAP can do a perfect fitting for the training model, but we want to test. I think that's the first thing we need to test is uh, if we have a good transferability across rotimers. We, we use trans rotimer. What if the rotimer is different in the MD simulation? Is the CMAP still, work, still working or not? So here I'm showing the energy surface from 14 SB, uh, QM, and 19 SB on the trans rotimer. So we initialize to be trans and relax it, but they are still in the trans. Do you mean the trans peptide bond? No, the, no, no, the trans rotimer for trans the rotimer. chi one. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. 175. But they, they should be a little different because of the relaxation, mm -hmm. right? But, uh, and if you look at the energy surface, uh, even after the relaxation, the QM still work, uh, still look almost the same as 19 SB because that's how we train it. And 14 SB doesn't look like QM, like the, if, like the the PB2 region, um, this is more, much more, uh, the, the energy basin is deeper than the, the beta region. And the question is, what if we, we use another rotimer? So we pick another rotimer, the Gauss minus rotimer. We initialize, initialize to be Gauss, uh, Gauss minus and uh, relax it. And the rotimer will still in that range, but still Gauss minus. Um, and we calculate QM, we calculate, we calculate 14 and 19 SB. And if you, if you compare the trans uh, QM with Gauss minus QM, they are different, right? In the, in the alpha basin, there is like a, like a diagonal shape here, but in the trans is more rigid. Also in the, the, uh, the positive side uh, region, they are very different. And if you look at 14 SP, they don't agree with QM. And if you look at 19 SP, at least we reproduce this region really well, and also in the positive five region. Uh, but that's like a qualitative compared, just realize the difference. So we, we did some quantification, we calculate the QM uh, difference, RMSD, and 14 SV QM difference is 1.7 kcal, and uh, 19 SV QM is nearly zero, because that's CMAP. Um, and also in the Gauss minus, the 14 SV QM difference is 1.4, and 19 SV QM is 0 0.9 kcal. So, uh, so next, I want to show some results uh, on the improvements of 19 SB RMD simulation in terms of agreeing with uh, different types of experiment. So first, to show this uh, fine side distribution, the alanine valine doesn't look like PDB and these, they are too similar uh, to each other. And when we do 19 SB, uh, we do simulation with 19 SB, at least the difference between alanine valine is reproduced. If you look at the valine in 19 SB, it's on the bottom right plot, the, the, alpha region, the alpha basin is very rigid, right? And uh, it's very uh, rigid. 
and there is like a, the, the peak on the beta and the PB2 are almost the same. And in the R, in the alanine, the alpha basin is more uh, diagonal, which is also uh, which is also agreeing with the PDB, and it prefers PB2 much more than the than the beta. Uh, but again, this is the comparison is limited by itself. We just we just compare dipeptide simulation to the PDB coil library. So we uh, do some other test. So we use the dipeptide uh, AMR data, the G coupling, and we compare to our uh, dipeptide ND that I showed earlier. So we look at the, we look at distribution. We see a really big difference from 14 to 19, but we want to quantify it. So here I'm showing the error against AMR G coupling data for different uh, four speed. So the red bars are 14 SB with um, different solvent model. So we run simulation with different um, solvent, uh, different force and solvent model, and we calculate the G coupling from the simulation using the coupling equation. And then the, the blue bars are 19 SB with different solvent model. So you really can see which one is better, right? But uh, if you think about the the, the, uh, the equation for the error calculation, we use chi square uh, that equals the difference between G uh, simulation and the G experiment divided by systematic error. The systematic error is uncertainty of couplers equation and the, the associated parameters in the couplers, which shows uncertainty of uh, correlate the dihedral value with some AMR experiment with G coupling. Right, so that uh, if we divide by that error, uh, that means if the chi square is uh, above one, is below than one, that means the disagreement between the simulation and experiments is even smaller than the systematic error of your calculation, right? And in, in, in that sense, 14 SB and 19 SB are both reasonable in, in this test. So this is not a very sensitive test, but, but why do I have to do this? Because uh, in the development, uh, I have some force that don't really work well in this plot. Uh, you can trust me on that. I have a lot of parameters that have like big error bars in this plot. So we have to make sure this passes, right? So and 19 SB with like a really systematic training, we, we pass this test. For instance, in the group, if we use alanine uh, CMAP and apply to billing and do this, the error bar can be really big. So the transferability is not very good. That's why we use alanine uh, for, for, for alanine and CMAP, uh, billing for, for billing. Um, so another uh, more uh, sensitive test is on the helical currency test. So I showed uh, this plot a while ago. Uh, on the 14 SVOPC, uh, the correlation is pretty bad with R squared 0.27. And when we update for, uh, first field from 14 to 19, R squared is 0.75. And the 19 SV were, was not trained against this data, which is trained against quantum. And we combine with OPC, which is also a quantum model, and got really good correlation. And in order to uh, plot this, uh, we need to run 1.5 millisecond MD simulation straight, not replica exchange, just straight MD. So um, we, we tested 19 SB with other water model as well. Here I'm just showing a few of them. Uh, 19 SB with T3P, with T4PW and OPC. If you uh, look at the correlation, 19 SB T3P is 0.5 on, on R squared. 19 SB T4PW is 0.6 with slow 1.3, uh, and 19 SB is the best. So, which means uh, if you still remember the, the plot I show on the errors of the water models in reproducing bulky properties, from T3P to T4PW and OPC, the water actually gets better and better in terms of reproducing bulky properties. And which means 19 SB can, a benefit of this is 19 SB can be even as a probe to test the water model quality. And, uh, and, and we think 19 SB can work well with any water model that really uh, reproduces the property property well. It doesn't have to be on OPC. Uh, I think T4PD might also be a good, uh, a, prom a promising uh, water model. So That's what's the reasoning behind that though? Because the, I mean, the, there are Leonard Jones parameters, right? Yeah. That, that there's this trade off between how you do the electrostatics and how you set the Leonard Jones, even the epsilon and sigma. Right. Um, yeah, so the, from T3P to T4P and to OPC, the dispersion on oxygen gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. So we have stronger interaction between solid and solvent uh, from T3P to OPC. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And in OPC, they also reach in the, uh, the electrostatic interaction, uh, electrostat uh, the partial charges by yeah. fitting to the QM uh, electrostatic potential. And like T4P, EW, and OPC both get lots of bulk properties very well fit across the entire range for PME. 
yep. but they're clearly very different from each other when mixed with uh, the force field, the Bertin force field, right? Yes. So is, is there some special property that OPC also has other than just fitting neat properties uh, that you think makes it play well with 19SB? Or do you, mm. do you see this for other good three-site water models or even good four-site water models? Is this good behavior? Um, I think, I think uh, if I look at the, the parameters on T4PW mm -hmm. and OPC, I found, uh, I, I only found that as the dispersion gets larger and larger, then the 19 SP performance gets better and better. Interesting. Yeah, I, I really don't know uh, what other, so we definitely see other difference mm -hmm. in between the water model, but I really cannot see a trend okay. on that. Yeah. So I think right now, I think the like, four point model is reasonable and we need to make, make sure the dispersion is strong enough. And we, we, we tested on other things like uh, MR order parameter on the, the globular proteins like GB3, uh, ubiquitin, and lysosome. So on the right, I'm showing the, the order parameter. The colors are the force field and black are the MR. And if you have very good agreement, no matter which force field we use, even 40SB OPC doesn't seem to be a good model, but in terms of this test, it's, it's, very, it's very reasonable. Um, and that's also why 14SB T3P can have a lot of, uh, there are a lot of great studies on that, right? It's, 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 it's accurate on some, in some cases. Uh, and if you look at RMSD histogram on the left, uh, the, blue, the blue curve is 19SB OPC. We see a uh, very interesting, 19SB is, is more stable than 14SB. Even though if we look at the, the helical frequency plot, 19SB are slightly over, overestimating the helicity, but it's even more stable than 14SB, which is, which is kind of surprising me. Uh, and this is just for 200 nanosecond MD, because for all the parameters, we really don't need to run that long, just need to run longer than the tumbling. Right? Um, so we also test whether uh, 19SB can accurately fold a helical structure and the beta hairpin. Here on the left is the K19 helices. The rest of the peptide is 19 residue long. We have a few glycines and then lysine, alanine, 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 and then some, some alanine afterwards. Um, so um, this is the testing system that we have used for 14SB development. So in the 14SB, we empirically uh, cracked the, the parameters together with TIP3P to better reproduce this type of data, which is K19 data, and also alanine 5. And that's why the, the K19 agrees pretty well with the, the, the black dots, which is the MR data. But if you look at the, the, the yellow curve, when we switch to a better water model, then the 14SB immediately fails. And if you look at 19SB OPC, uh, both are quantum, but they also agree pretty well with the experiment. I think that's very, very exciting to us. Um, and also, uh, since we see the final frequency is little uh, shifted uh, to the up to the up left, which over, little overestimating on the helicity. And if you look at the K19, it's also overestimating by like 0.1 kcal. So we want to see if the, that over overestimating on helicity will compromise on the beta hairpin stability. So we test the CLN25. We run from extended and native for like 56 microseconds collectively. And we see, uh, we use 14SB T3P, 14SB OPC, and 19SB OPC. And the red one is 14SB T3P. Uh, that's the most stable. That's more stable than 19SB. Uh, 19SB is a blue one, uh, but it's still reasonable, right? And the, the yellow one is 14SB OPC, and we see a broad peak in the, the unfolded uh, structures, like the, the high MSB here. So, um, to, to make the conclusion, in 19SB, we, we introduced a couple of five side diagonal parameters for uh, each of the amino acids uh, uh, separately. And we have uh, significantly improved the backbone profiles for 20 amino acids, which can be seen from the PDB uh, com comparison. And, uh, and, uh, um, and 19SB has improved the uh, amino acid specific properties, uh, like the G coupling and helical prince K and uh, it's reasonably reproducing the secondary structure content, uh, like helical content and the beta hair instability, and also the order parameter of the proteins. So in terms of the availability of the force field, uh, we have the manuscript on the CAM archive, and it's in the review pr reviewing process uh, of, from GCTC, and the code parameters and test cases are on the GitHub, and uh, it's already, uh, everything's implemented in Ember already. If you have a 
uh, if you have Ember tools, even if you just have Ember tools, you can just update and everything will be in there. Uh, and Ember 20 uh, will be next year. And we also provided some test cases um, for outside Ember, uh, but that test case is only on the first year implementation. So we, we provide some structures, we provide energies from ITSB, and the user can check if the energies are exactly reproduced using their implementation to check if they are implementing ITSB in the, in the correct way. Do you know if it made it into an update on the Ember Tools 19 Conda package? Or if that hasn't been built yet? Conda package. Is a Conda package where people can grab all the Ember Tools, which has Leap and all the force fields in it as well. Oh. Um, Dave Casey's group was handling yeah, the yeah, I, of that I, with high. I, yeah, I, I did that patch. Uh, but I, I, I moved to the Ember 19 with patches. Oh, with patches? Yeah, so. that, that branch. So I think that's a different branch. Okay. Than, from what, what how, how long ago was, it, uh, was the patch released out of curiosity? Like last week. Last week. Okay. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> hot off the presses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the availability. Uh, and uh, with that, I want to first thanks to my uh, advisor, Carl Simulain. Uh We have collaborator from uh, Brookhaven, Qin Wu. Uh, and this first few project was funded uh, three years ago by NSF. Um, and also uh, thanks to OpenFF and MSK, Seth John for inviting. Thanks to uh, Jaws group, we had a nice lunch and good discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, with that, I'm ready to take any questions. Let's start with any questions from Zoom so we don't forget anybody. Yeah, this is David Mobley in Irvine. Um, I was curious if you Feel like you see any evidence for needs to refit the Leonard Jones, and how easy it would be to sort of redo this with refit Leonard Jones? Um, I, I think I think it's um, to our experience, it's not very straightforward to to refit Leonard Jones to achieve at least uh, better amino acid specific properties like uh, helical propensity or uh, the... Yeah, that's not what, what I'm asking. I guess I'm asking, you know, do you see any evidence that some of the Leonard Jones might be wrong? And then if somebody oh, yeah. Had, yeah, if yeah, somebody yeah. handed you Leonard Jones that had been refit, how hard yeah. would it be to redo we, it? We, we, we did some like um, empirical, uh, we did some like empirical uh, correction to the Leonard Jones. So for instance, when we do the valency map, we, we see a disagreement between the QM and MM, but since Vailing uh, has a beta branch, so it might be the, the number, so the error might be the number on the error, it might be the Leonard Jones. So we empirically shift the Leonard Jones curve to the left or to the right, like in the like grid searching mm -hmm. manner, and see if the agreement between QM and MM gets uh, a lot better. Uh, but actually it's not guaranteed. So some structures, so, so we have like 24 times 24 structures on the five size space. Some structures get better, some structures don't. So it's really hard to see uh, if we can do a like, systematic correction to the Leonard Jones that can um, uh, guarantee the better agreement between QM and MM, yeah. from my experience, yeah. Yeah, but that, I think that's a very good question. That, that's something that we definitely, because uh, the dihedral correction is actually correcting for the different terms, like bound angles and the 1-4. 1-4 is probably the empirical, two empirical, and the Leonard Jones, and also the charge, charge model. So. Uh, but since we, if we cannot do a really systematic correction to the non-bounded term or other bounded, then probably dihedral fading is, is the most, uh, the easiest way to do and the most straightforward way to do. More questions from Zoom. Uh, hi, maybe I can make a question from Esteban from Chile. I wanted to ask if you have a feeling what the role of explicit waters will be. So if you compare implicit calculations and you would redo it with explicit uh, solvent, would it change your MM reference data or the QM data? You mean in the training? Yeah. So yeah, because so in principle you could add ex explicit water with molecules, right? Right. So would it make a difference on the dihedral plots? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in the training, uh, in the training part, well, we use uh, GB, GBNAC2 plus uh, SASA term, and that will. Uh, so, and in the QM, we use uh, SMD solvent model. So, they they should be uh, canceled on the solvation part. Um, but uh, in terms of the, like uh, doing explicit in the MM, then we probably need to do TI calculation for each of the grid point on the on the same map. 
So for each of the uh, 50, uh, 576 structures, we have to do TI to calculate the solvation energies and add to the MM and do the QM and to, to get the CMM. Okay. That, they're probably too expensive. Uh, and we think the reason why we use our GBSA uh, in the training is because uh, theoretically it's very similar to the SM, to, to the PCM solid model. They're both using the, the, the Born or Anzagar model. And uh, so they are they both uh, define that actually boundary and they have like effective radii. So we think uh, in, in theory they should be similar because we really can see they, they perfectly cancel in the salvation part. Right. Did you have to do any refitting of the GBNet parameters to the, um, the quantum level you were using or the implicit solvent model that you were using? If we change GB model? Did, did you have to refit the GB model parameters? Because there's no. still a bunch of parameters with the GB model. Yeah, we, we use GBNet too. We so, so you didn't change those parameters, we, even though they were fit. But, we, but, but we tested like GBOBC and uh -huh. GBNet, GBNet2. Since it's a dipeptide, yeah. it's fully exposed to the solvent. Yeah. So you can imagine it's almost like zero, right? Yeah. So uh, they are almost the same. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it, even we, we even do some TI calculations with OPC T3P. Mm -hmm. They are very similar to the GB energy probes because it's so small. It, it's like just fully exposed to the solvent. Mm -hmm. There is no barrier. Um, so we think it probably find the, in theory, the, the implicit is, it should be better because mm -hmm. we use implicit in QM as well. I yeah, hope that un answer your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, maybe a second question. Could you yeah. remind, remind me what the difference in the charge model between FF14SP and FF19SP is? They are the same charge model. So it's the same charge model? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions from Zoom? Or from New York? I don't have a good propensity, but are there criteria you would consider to say that this is a good fit for you? What are other things that are usually tested? Oh, yeah. Um, so actually, the, the reason why we do, uh, the, so if you look, if you, uh, look at the, the testing, we, after we generate CMAP, we do basically three things. We, we run um, MD on that peptide with that CMAP. And we compare to PDB and we quantify that error by MRG coupling. And then we calculate the frequency and compare, right? The reason why we do this is because for the G coupling, that's only depend on phi dihedral. It's like uh, the hydrogen on the amide, between hydrogen on the amide and hydrogen on the CR, right? It's, uh, it's, deep, it's correlated with the phi, phi, phi dihedral. So uh, with that test, we can at least we can uh, be sure of whether the, the barrier between the beta and P2 is right or wrong, but we really don't know about the side that That's why we do the helical currency test. So we, 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 we do that following some logic uh, so that we can uh, like fully test the whole parameter space. We definitely cannot test the whole parameter space because that would be so large, but I think that would be, with that three tests, we, I think we'll, that would be enough. And then we combine those parameters, combine those CMAPs and test on the bigger proteins and see if that worked well. Uh, and yeah. I think importantly, your surrogates require only a few hundred nanoseconds of big proteins or uh, a few microseconds or milliseconds of right. small peptides, right? right. So they're right. tractable in a finite amount of computational time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there true. is the worry though that like the J coupling constants, mm -hmm. uh, maybe less so with the S squares, but for fractional velocity, certainly these are all interpreted uh, mm. through a model that mm. like the Karpolis equation is just a cosine expansion, right? Yes, it's, yes, yes. it's probably wrong. And it's probably wrong. The, yeah. The coefficients are kind of per have been fit for each amino acid type or for each. The, the the parameters that I use for the for the G coupling calculation mm -hmm. is uh, I think that's the original parameter set. But I, there are many parameter sets. There are many parameters. Yes. Yes. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. the fractional helicity, of course, is a total interpretation of a CD experiment, presumably a temperature dependent CD experiment. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Even the the K nineteen the helical content they, they were assigned from the chemical shift. For the chemical shifts, I from, see. Yeah, so they just uh, assume like from zero to one, yeah. and any chemical shift below, uh, mm -hmm. no, any value within it just assign a percentage, mm -hmm. right? That's where we got the like thirty percent helicity. Uh, that's where how that's how we got this data. Have there been other um, experimental or biophysical or thermochemical thermophysical uh, benchmarks you've been thinking about looking after in the 
in the future or like Dave Case has been simulating crystals. So you actually right. puts it in the crystal, it cools it down and then right, right. runs a simulation. Are, yeah. there, are there other, if you, if you had the opportunity to, that you would benchmark against? Right. I think we we'll probably do some real application studies with, mm -hmm. the, with the forest field, like drug blending or yeah. other, yeah, yeah. other stuff. So we can, uh, but in terms of the parameters, we think this probably enough. Maybe we can test alpha L because we haven't mm -hmm. touched that area. Um, but yeah, since um, since we, we we really cannot, so we have to trust quantum, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's our target data. But obviously, there is some uncertainty in the quantum calculation as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think maybe maybe alpha L might be something we can test. Any more questions? Anything else from Zoom? If not, let's uh, uh, thank Fun again. Thanks everybody who joined remotely.